I'm ITV's Judge Rinder. I've been a criminal barrister for over a decade. I'm going to be examining cases that have shocked the nation. A brutal murder in a churchyard. She was covered in blood. She was more strangled with a, like a garrote. Police asked if I would accompany them to the station. They wouldn't allow me to see my parents. They wouldn't offer me a solicitor. I was stunned. I had no idea of what was going to happen. But would the killer be brought to justice? The fascination was there. Is he innocent? You know, did somebody else do it? The more he dug into it, there was more questions than were answers. I ended up with a brick through the window at the office. I had a hit-and-run attempt. The police said to me, you're wasting your time. Everything, and I mean everything, has been burnt, lost, and destroyed. This is Judge Rinder's crime stories. This is the case of a 17-year-old boy who was convicted of murder in a case that stunned the nation and one that went down in criminal history. This is the story of Stephen Downing. Stephen's story all started 42 years ago in the picturesque village of Bakewell in the Peak District. The area's beautiful scenery attracts thousands of tourists each year. And in 1973, the then 17-year-old Stephen Downing was lucky enough to call it home. I had a really good upbringing. Lived in a quiet neighborhood. Each family tended to know each other and always helped each other out. And it was a time when you could, you could walk out and leave your door unlocked. And you know full well you could come back and nobody had ever been in. Stephen and younger sister Christine had a wonderful childhood with parents Ray and Juanita. We were quite a close-knit family. Money was often tight, but they would go out of the way to make sure that we had things that we'd like, even if it meant doing without themselves. It was a, a very happy upbringing. Quite a lot of people that knew us knew that if they needed help in any way, you know, we'd do all that we could to help them. Um, both mum and my dad um, had that attitude that if you can help somebody, you do. And they brought us up to be the same. Stephen had struggled through school because of learning difficulties. But age 17, he'd finally found a job he enjoyed, working for the council as a gardener at the local cemetery. My main roles working for the council in the cemetery was maintaining the graves, making sure the grass was cut, uh, everywhere was tidy. It was a lot of work for one person, but um, I enjoyed it. I was sort of around 13, 14 when he was working in the cemetery. It was sort of general maintenance, cutting the grass, making sure that, you know, the graves were kept nice and tidy. And I think that was important to him because he sort of felt that, in a way, it was sort of his duty to look after other people's families. But on the 12th of September, 1973, Stephen's peaceful existence was to be turned upside down. It was a Wednesday, as I recall. It was my first day back at work, having been off with uh, a cold for a couple of three days. And uh, my mother was saying, you know, do you think you should go back just yet? And I said, well, yeah, I said, I don't like being off too long. Stephen would soon come to regret his diligence that day. And everything was normal to start with. And then round about midday, I thought, I've run out of uh, lemonade. I was too late uh, getting it from the shop. They'd already shut for lunch. So I'd call home. Before leaving, Stephen noticed in the distance a local lady walking in the graveyard, but thought nothing of it. At home, he caught up with his mother. He says, yeah, I'll get you another bottle of lemonade and I'll bring it down for you. I says, right. He says, are you stopping for a cup of tea? And I says, no, I want to get back. And, uh, and with that, I left. When Stephen returned to the cemetery, he made a shocking discovery that would change his life forever. He found the body of the woman he'd noticed earlier lying on the graveyard pavement. I went over, discovered that she was covered in blood and, and everything. Turned her over, felt for her pulse. 
I found a very faint one at the carotid artery. Uh, fell for one between her breasts, which I found. She was making gurgling noises, but only semi-conscious. Um, wasn't responding to any speech or anything like that. The woman was 32-year-old legal secretary, Wendy Sewell, who just endured a vicious attack in broad daylight. Stephen ran to find his colleague who phoned the police and the ambulance service. It took about 45, 50 minutes, I think, for an ambulance to get to the scene. In the meantime, uh, police just asked a few questions, got in touch with some senior colleagues. They came up, had a few questions, and then asked if I would accompany them to the station for further interview. I said, yes. The first I heard about Steve being questioned was when I came home from school. My parents told me that Steve was helping with inquiries, and at the time, that's what the police kept telling us. At first, um, obviously, you feel proud that he's in a position that he can help. A barely conscious Wendy Sewell was taken to Chesterfield Royal Hospital while Stephen headed off with the police. I wasn't handcuffed or anything like that. I was taken down to an interview room. As far as I'm aware, from that moment on, uh, I was guilty uh, because I was the sole person working there and there was no one else they could pinpoint it on. Stephen was an easy target only 17 years old and classed as having learning difficulties. He had the reading age of an 11-year-old. A person who should have been handled with care was instead that day subjected to a grueling interrogation. They kept me talking uh, for around nine hours. They wouldn't allow me to see my parents. They wouldn't offer me a solicitor uh, saying that I didn't need one and that I was only being there to assist them with their inquiries. And in such, I wouldn't need any solicitor or anything like that. As time went on, the evening went on, then you start to get more worried. And, you know, you start to think, well, there's something more to this. Why are they keeping him? And they kept saying that he was still helping with inquiries. But it sort of got late into the evening. And we'd got um, journalists here and and different people, they um, said, you know, I think this has gone on long enough, you need to go and fetch him. While Stephen was questioned, Wendy Sewell remained in a critical condition in hospital. Stephen was facing serious charges of attempted murder, and it was clear the police thought they had their man. To strengthen their case, all they needed was a confession. They asked me to make a statement. Um, and I said, well, I was embarrassed, uh, so I asked one of them to write it down for me, took it all down in pencil, then asked me uh, at the end of it to sign it in biro. Uh, at the time, I thought it was strange, but I did it anyway. And throughout it, the interview, they, they was prompting me as to what to say. And uh, I mean, I, I said, I watched her walk around the cemetery. And they said, you followed her? I said, no, I w watched her walk. Yeah, but if you followed her with your eyes, that's the same, amounts to the same thing. And I said, well, yeah, all right. But in the statement, they said I'd followed her. I think they'd wanted to make that statement to fit their own uh, pattern of uh, belief. And it didn't matter who, who was to blame. Uh, they, they just wanted to wrap everything up as quickly as possible. My first reaction was the same as everybody else's when the police told us that um, Steve had admitted it, that we just didn't believe it. Um, it's just not Steve. It's not the sort of thing that he would do. Steve would help people. Steve wouldn't hurt people. It's just not in his nature. I think probably the reason that he did finally admit it, um, albeit false, was a number of factors, partly because he was tired, he was hungry, he was scared. He was actually in quite a lot of pain because he'd got a back injury, which later needed surgery. So there were so many contributing factors. Any one of them could have just triggered him to say, well, yes, all right, I've done it. And when she wakes up, she'll tell them different. The police now had a signed confession. 
which was enough to charge Stephen just one day after his arrest. He was remanded in custody for attempted murder. His fate hanging in the balance. The only hope now was for Wendy Sewell to recover and name her attacker. But the following day, things went from bad to worse. On the 14th of September, 1973, Wendy died in hospital. They charged me with attempted murder. News got in that Wendy Sewell had passed away uh, in the hospital and never gained con consciousness. They amended it to murder. When we heard that Wendy died, obviously it's a shock because we were expecting her to regain consciousness and tell them that Steve had had no involvement. With the one witness who could prove his innocence now dead, Stephen's only hope of freedom was to put his faith in the legal system. Now, there are already many things that have gone wrong with how the police interrogated Stephen. Just for example, he was under 18 and had learning difficulties, so should have had either a parent or an appropriate adult and definitely a solicitor with him at all times during the interviews. After the break, Stephen goes on trial for murder. Will he clear his name or will he be found guilty? It was just obvious that he'd had no involvement. Even the media that were in court they were just all convinced that he was going to be cleared. I was stunned, I suppose in a way frightened really, because I had no idea of what was going to happen. Before the break, we heard about Stephen Downing, the 17-year-old boy who on the 12th of September 1973 made a gruesome discovery in the graveyard where he was working as a gardener. Secretary Wendy Sewell had been left for dead following a brutal attack, and two days later she died in hospital. Stephen was a prime suspect, and after signing a confession, he was charged with Wendy's murder. He was kept in custody at Risley Remand Centre, where the seriousness of the situation began to sink in. I was stunned, I suppose in a way frightened really, because I had no idea of what was going to happen. Being on remand, it wasn't the best of places to be at Risley. As you went through reception, they would often say, none's coming through, and that means not of normal criminal element, a really terrifying place. I was taken to court every Friday morning for the magistrates to re-sentence me for a further seven days. And it was after the 13th week that uh, I was then committed to trial. Stephen's trial date was set for the 13th of February, 1974, but he would not be pleading guilty. Only three days after his forced confession, he'd already decided to change his plea. I mean, yes, I initially had pleaded guilty because I, I was uh, being constantly questioned for this nine hours. At the time, I had a back injury, which was giving me severe pain. Uh, I wasn't allowed any medication or anything like that. And I said to my family, I said, I'm not guilty, I didn't do it. Uh, it's, and I, I broke down on this. They said, well, well, don't worry. Whether you did it or we, you didn't do it, we will stand by you regardless. And we will do everything you, we can for you. But in our view, we know you didn't do it. Nothing would convince me or my mum and dad that he'd had any involvement whatsoever. Not even for a minute. I don't think we ever believed that Steve was going to be convicted. When we eventually did get to see um, copies of statements and things, it was just obvious that it, he'd had no involvement and everybody was convinced that it would just be cleared that when it went to court. As the trial started at Nottingham Crown Court, Stephen put his faith in the legal system, believing he would be cleared of Wendy's murder. At the start of the trial, I always happy that things was moving and hopefully it was going to prove my innocence. We weren't actually allowed to go into the court during the hearing because um, Mum had seen Steve when he came home at the lunchtime and therefore she was a witness. So that meant that we weren't allowed to go into court either because um, obviously we could tell her what other people had said. But from what we'd been told by other people, um, everything was going his way. Even the media that were in court 
all asked for photographs because, you know, they were just all convinced that he was going to be cleared. The case for the prosecution centred on Stephen's signed confession and the evidence of the police forensic expert, who asserted that the blood found on Stephen's clothing would only have been there if he was responsible for the assault. I didn't understand a lot of the stuff that was going on in, in the courtroom because a lot of it was legal jargon and I just had to, had to accept that uh, everybody was working on my behalf to clear my name. We were all very optimistic when we went in for the verdict. We thought it was just a formality that they were going to say not guilty and that he'd be coming home with us. On the 15th of February, 1974, just three days after the trial began, it took the jury just one hour to reach their verdict. I was totally shocked because I didn't believe that uh, a jury, having heard the evidence, would, would find me guilty because there was virtually nothing put forward by the prosecution and defence at the time wasn't, wasn't the best. But I thought, well, that, you know, they'd put it across as strongly as they could. And uh, when they read out a guilty verdict, I, I was just shocked. I think the initial feeling when we, got, we heard the guilty verdict was just disbelief. No, they've got it wrong. They're going to realise that they've got it wrong. I asked if I could see my parents and sister uh, once I'd been taken downstairs to the holding cells. And they said, yes, you can briefly see them. And I think we was there about 10, 15 minutes. And with that, I was ushered out. Those last few minutes that we had with Steve before they took him away, we were just all really emotional, um, still in a state of shock, and not knowing where he was going, um, how long it would be before we'd see him again. And I think that was really the hardest thing of any of it, was just, you know, sort of saying goodbye to him. It's like a bereavement. It's like, you know, part of your family's gone. You just sort of can't explain to people what that's like. Stephen was sentenced to life in prison. And his insistence that he hadn't done it could keep him behind bars for good. As far as the, the authorities were concerned, if you don't play guilty, you can't show remorse, therefore you're a risk to the public, and they couldn't give you parole. And I just felt terrible for my family, but I knew in my own mind that I was just going to uh, label myself as something I wasn't, and that was a murderer. Stephen was classed as IDOM, which simply means in denial of murder. Unless he was prepared to change his mind, Stephen was now facing the rest of his life in jail. It's just classed as detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, which means that there is no actual sentence. It's not, you will be in prison for X number of years. But Stephen was determined to fight for his freedom. And on the 25th of October, 1974, he appealed against his conviction. I asked my solicitor to lodge an appeal, which he did, but uh, I think he was sort of of the opinion, well, we'll do it as a matter of court, but I don't think you'll get anywhere. And true sure enough, we did. After this failed attempt, Stephen had to get used to life behind bars. My first night in prison, that's one thing all. It was strange because it was so quiet. You'd only got your own thoughts. I'd, I'd got nothing no radio or anything like that to listen to. All you could do is try and sleep. But I, I've got so much going on in my mind as what's going to happen, how long will I be here? And it was scary and also very lonely because even though you've probably got three or 400 people in that prison, you were so much on your own as well. And you was locked up for at least 15 hours a day. A very harsh reality, really, from what you was accustomed to outside. Steve had the hardest of all because we'd got each other, whereas Steve had only sort of got us on visits or 
letters and that was hard. I sort of felt guilty about still having a life. As time ticked on, Stephen had to accept the best years of his life were passing him by. Psychologist Emma Kenny understands the feeling of loss Stephen may have been experiencing. Going to prison when you are 17 and knowing that you are potentially never going to get out would have been so overwhelming for Stephen. But more importantly, as every year passed by, so too did the milestones that other people would have been granted. Obviously, I think Steve has missed out on things. Um, he's missed out on various jobs, different friends that he might have made. Who knows, he might have been married and had a family. You can't really sort of judge how that person would have been. The things I miss most in prison was obviously family contact. We was, we were and still are. Well, my parents have passed away now, but um, right up to then, we were a very close-knit family. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I had a wonderful family. Despite his nightmare, Stephen was determined to make the most of his time in prison. It was whilst I was in prison that I was able to try and educate myself the best I could. Did a few exams, got certificates, and it was my view that I'm going to make the best of the time that I'd got in prison to better myself, get myself an education, and obviously be able to look to a better future as and when that was to happen. Meanwhile, on the outside, Stephen's family were tirelessly lobbying to get him freed. We never accepted the conviction. My dad said that he would never give up until he'd succeeded in proving him innocent. And right from day one, you know, he did all he could to find things out, um, to try and disprove what the police had said. He had folders and folders worth of paperwork and statements and and different things, and, you know, my mum and dad never gave up. In 1994, after Stephen had already spent 20 years in prison, his parents, Ray and Juanita, approached Don Hale, an investigative journalist and editor of local paper, The Matlock Mercury, to help clear Stephen's name. The first time I heard about the, the murder of Wendy Sewell was when uh, Stephen's parents contacted me uh, and they reckoned that they'd had a phone call to say that new evidence that could have cleared Stephen um, had been passed to me or was being passed to me. It was something initially I didn't necessarily want to get involved with, but the fascination was there. Is he uh, innocent? You know, did somebody else do it? Is he serving time for a crime he didn't commit? So it was interesting in that respect. Ray and Juanita had done enough to fire up Don's interest in their son's case, and he was soon looking to the people of Bakewell for help. And I just put the word out that I was going to look at the case to see whether there, there was anything in it. And the number of people that contacted me to say he was innocent and that, you know, thank God somebody's looking at it um, and were giving me contacts and phone numbers and, oh, you must see so-and-so, you must go to, to this lady. She was uh, near the crime scene. But not everyone in this close-knit community wanted to help Don with his investigation. Almost from day one, when word gets around in the small community that I'm looking into it, some people don't want you to look into it for whatever reason, um, I ended up with a brick through the window at the office. We ended up with a firebomb setting fire to all, all the bins and stuff outside one time. I had a hit and run attempt uh, on me <laughs> uh, one night. I was followed by a car and then um, it tried to run me over and I was crossed the road. As he looked at it further, uh, and certainly got a few death threats and that himself. Um, he thought, well, I'm onto something here. And the, the more he dug into it, uh, there was more questions than were answers. A lot of people just wanted to clam up. For over 20 years, Stephen Downing had been in prison for a crime he hadn't committed. And the only person on the outside fighting for his freedom were his close family 
and investigative journalist Don Hale. After the break, Don's investigation unearths new evidence, which could clear Stephen's name. But would Stephen be denied the freedom he so justly deserved? The police were adamant. They said to me, you're wasting your time. Everything has been burnt, lost, and destroyed. We had five witnesses that could actually have helped clear Stephen. They saw the victim still alive after Stephen had left. Downing, the innocent boy of 17, sentenced to life in prison for murder he did not commit. By 1994, after 20 years behind bars, Stephen thought he'd never be freed. But renewed hope came in the form of investigative journalist Don Hale, who, despite receiving death threats and being the target of an attempted hit and run himself, was now hell bent on clearing Stephen's name. Don's initial inquiries around Bakewell turned up some interesting leads. Certain names came up of potential witnesses that hadn't been uh, interviewed at the time, or that could have, their testimony that they had given to the police um, could actually have possibly cleared Stephen because they saw the victim still alive after Stephen had left the area where the crime took place. So there's a whole range of uh, points that were coming up. But for Don, his next step seemed obvious. One of the first points of call really was to contact the police or to say, uh, I've been told that there's some fresh evidence that may come into uh, play here, that he could be innocent. Um, I want to start some investigations just to see where we're, where we're at with it. But Don soon realized that he was to receive little assistance from the police themselves. The police were adamant. They said to me, uh, you're wasting your time. Everything, and I mean everything, has been burnt, lost, and destroyed. This case was 20 odd years old, and they didn't want to know which again, to me, rang alarm bells, because if somebody's in prison and they are you know, pleading innocent, say they haven't done it, there's always that possibility that something could come along to prove that they were right and that they were innocent and they're serving time for somebody else. It's a very close-knit community. It's Bakewell, it's a small area. Police and other authorities didn't want to open up or anything like that. Fortunately, his position as editor of the local paper meant Don had a number of contacts who were willing to help. Through various covert drop-offs, Don got his hands on police papers, which hadn't, in fact, been destroyed, and within which he discovered witnesses whose evidence could have helped Stephen's case all those years earlier. And what I was able to put together was a number of these witnesses had given the times of when they were heading back to, to town and they'd looked over the wall in the cemetery and seen Wendy Sewell still alive. We'd also um, got two other witnesses uh, who'd seen Stephen leaving the cemetery while she was still alive. And their words were that he was cool and calm and perfectly normal, not running away or covered in blood or anything else. He was just, you know, walking away quite normal. So we had five witnesses that could actually have helped clear Stephen in one, one way or another. Uh, and, and many of these were, were just totally ignored. These witnesses supported Stephen's claims that when he left the cemetery to go home to get more pop, Wendy Sewell was still alive and well. But these statements weren't the only thing Don uncovered. He also unearthed some new forensic evidence at the Downing family home. When I went back to see the parents, um, I was quite surprised that they had uh, all Stephen's clothes, original clothes from the day of the murder, which still had some blood stains on them, uh, on his boots, um, his jeans, there was some blood on the knee, there was some on, on his, um, his T-shirt. You know, had to really look for it. There were little tiny specks, um, which were just showing as little dark specks, almost like paint, if you like, but not sufficient, in my opinion, just on a, a first view of somebody who has committed this brutal attack, because it would have been pretty horrific. He worked in the cemetery. He'd found the injured woman uh, on returning from his lunch around about 20 past one. He saw a half-naked woman basically in the cemetery struggling. He knelt down beside her to, to try and help her. She was more or less unconscious. 
Don got a new forensic expert on board to re-examine the clothing. And the shocking discovery immediately threw doubt onto the police forensic evidence used at the trial. The expert was able to reanalyze all of this on, based on modern terms, DNA and all the rest, found out, yes, it was Wendy's blood. But the reason uh, it happened is that exactly the way Stephen said it happened, that he found her, knelt in the blood, and we found out then, 22 years later, this wasn't fresh blood, like she'd just been attacked. He knelt down in her, her blood. This was congealed blood that had happened 10, 20 minutes, whatever, later. And it, it, there's a different reaction. It's a different type of blood. It's, it all changes. The original forensic expert said, well, this is proof uh, of his attack, basically, with the, with the blood staining. And the expert would say, no, this is proof that it, it happened the way he said it happened, in that he knelt down to help her. The forensic expert found even more evidence to vindicate Stephen on the pickaxe handle used in the vicious attack on Wendy. We managed to locate the uh, murder weapon from the police museum, where it was the prime exhibit. He was able to analyze different things from that. And again, he found original police evidence, uh, forensic evidence from, from the day that wasn't disclosed, which confirmed that there were hairs and fibers um, and even a palm print on the murder weapon that did not belong to uh, Stephen or to um, Wendy. They came from a third party. Don also explored the questionable police tactics used in extracting Stephen's confession on the day of the attack. He was tired, he was hungry, his back was hurting. He was of low uh, IQ, you know, the reading age of an 11-year-old. And he was constantly denied access to a parent, a friend, a solicitor, anything. He wasn't cautioned, but the police by then were still trying to build up a case that they thought he was something to do with, if he, if he was the main attacker. Finally, in 1997, after three years of investigations, Don felt he had enough evidence to go to the Criminal Cases Review Commission to request a second appeal. Part of the second appeal was based on the, the, the new evidence that we managed to put together over this, this period. So we had the three experts on board, the ex-police expert who could tell us about procedure, police procedure, what should have happened, the way he should have been treated, that he couldn't have been bullied and forced into signing confession didn't make any sense. We got the forensic expert and we got the photographic expert. It wasn't until the 15th of January 2002 that Stephen's case was finally heard at the Court of Appeal. They accepted that the new forensic evidence put forward contradicted their forensic evidence from the, the time of the original case. And so it made the, uh, their evidence unreliable and more likely, uh, if not to be exact, um, match the findings of the new forensic expert. We said it was more likely to have happened the way he uh, said it happened and that it, it, it tied in with Stephen's mention of the events. So it, it all sort of came together that way. Could Stephen's wait for justice finally be over? There was a lot of legal jargon going on and I, I was just enough onto a world map of my own. and. Uh, I suddenly heard him say, conviction quashed. Well, I missed something there, what was that? And, and then it sunk in moments later. Of course, the whole courtroom was cheering and everything. And uh, we, I was just able to get up and walk out. It was, it was marvellous. You know, we finally got Steve now after nearly 28 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit. the Crown accepted two arguments put forward by the defence. The first being Stephen's confession should never have been allowed to go before a jury in 1974. The Crown also agreed with the defence argument that more recent knowledge of blood splattering patterns meant the prosecution's claim that the blood could only have been found on the clothes of the attacker was questionable. For Stephen and his family, this was finally the end of a 27-year nightmare and what had now become one of the longest miscarriages of justice in British legal history. We never gave up hope that we would see Steve as a free man. If it had taken another 10 years to fight it, we'd have done it because we always believed he was innocent and no one and nothing would convince us otherwise and we just wouldn't have given up. 
It was just wonderful being able to walk out the courts. You, you could hardly move that there was that many uh, press outside the courts, all clamouring for pictures and a story and all that. All I could virtually say was, um, I'm thankful for all the support everybody's given me and, you know, I'm just grateful that it's turned out the way it has. It was just nice to be back with family, being able to talk with them whenever you wanted, watch television, uh, go to bed when you wanted, uh, get up and go out if you wanted or whatever. From everybody, cheers. Today and the rest of your life. Mum and my dad did an amazing job keeping us all focused on what we had to fight for and we achieved the goal in the end. You know, Stephen Downing's was a landmark case and still remains one of the longest miscarriages of justice in British legal history. The question, of course, remains, who did kill Wendy Sewell? No, I can't say he was the killer. I'm not saying he was the murderer, but he was seen running away from the scene of crime within minutes of the attack, and he'd never been interviewed. I realised that I was looking at the same evidence I'd looked at for the Yorkshire Ripper. Before the break, we heard how after 27 years behind bars, in 2002, Stephen Downing was finally released for a murder he did not commit. This was one of the longest miscarriages of justice in UK criminal history, but the story doesn't end there. With Stephen cleared, it meant the real killer was never and has never been brought to justice. The police were under huge pressure to reopen their investigation. And following the 2002 appeal, they launched Operation Noble. Former police intelligence officer Chris Clark has a pretty dim view of the police investigation. The original aim of Operation Noble was a public inquiry to appease that Derbyshire police had done everything in the original investigation and re-examination possible to make sure that no one else was suspected of Wendy Searle's murder. The police interviewed 1,600 witnesses and there were 22 possible suspects, many of whom had been suggested by Don Hale during his campaign. But all of them were eliminated from the police inquiry. For the police, it was case closed. The police may have ended their investigation, but others were still on the hunt for the real killer. In 2012 to 2015, I researched a number of unsolved murders of unaccompanied women throughout the 1970s. As a police officer, um, you're after the truth and justice, justice for the victim, and also justice for the people wrongly accused. It's not for a police officer to, uh, to judge people, but to gather evidence for someone else to make a decision. We're now looking at a murder that happened about 42 years ago. There's a lot of new evidence that's come to light, including DNA, that can probably throw light onto actually who committed this, this murder. In 2002, Don Hale published a book about Stephen's plight and his own investigation to uncover the truth. It was 11 years later that Chris Clark was to read a copy and make a startling discovery. I originally read Don Hale's book and saw the method that was employed to attack Wendy Sewell. And I realised that I was looking at the same evidence I'd looked at for the Yorkshire Ripper. After drawing comparisons, Chris made contact with Stephen to track down the original pathology report on Wendy Sewell. Immediately upon reading it, I realised there were signs of asphyxiation to Wendy, including a bruise near her Adam's apple at the front and severe bruising to the deep muscle tissue at the back of her neck. She was more strangled with a, like a garrote, um, and then she'd been hit and strangled, etc. And Chris Clark believes it's, it's the, the hallmarks of the Yorkshire Ripper. During the 1974 trial, the pathologist had made no mention of asphyxiation. The prosecution put forward the fact that she'd been bashed on the head eight or nine times with a pickaxe handle. They allowed evidence to say that was conclusive to, to killing her. 
There was no mention about asphyxiation whatsoever. The reasons I believe Stephen Downing could not have committed the crime were A, the timings of where he was at the relevant time prior to Wendy's body being found. And secondly, the evidence in the pathologist and prosecution's own report, which uh, actually says she was asphyxiated. The asphyxiation had to be by a knotted rope because of the bruising found on her Adam's apple and the back of her neck. Clearly, he, he could not have committed the crime because he did not have the means to asphyxiate Wendy Searle either on him or left at the scene of the crime. She had a broken shoulder. She was badly kicked and bruised. Stephen hadn't been asked about any of these. Uh, there were also strangulation marks. There were bruising around the throat. So this is complete contrast to what the confession made. Unfortunately, Chris's theory has never been officially investigated. And until it is, we will never truly know if Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, could be held accountable. Don's own investigations threw up very real suspects, including two detailed witness accounts of a man fleeing the scene of the crime. One lady was quite adamant about what she had seen that day in 1973. It was quite clear that she'd seen a, a man running, as she described, like a bat out of hell, uh, from the back of the cemetery just after the time of the murder. And she described his, uh, his clothing, his jeans. She gave me a full description of everything. And she said he had blood stains on his trousers. I then later found another witness who'd seen maybe the same man or another similar running man. When I was asking him, any idea who it, who it is? Oh, yeah, I can tell you exactly who it is. And she gave me the name of this person. And she said, I've actually got a photograph of him that was in the paper. And so here you've got a photograph of a man, a description, the name, all the details of him, but nobody actually interviewed him. Now, I can't say he was the killer. I'm not saying he was the murderer, but he was seen running away from the scene of crime within minutes of the attack. And he'd never been interviewed until 22 years or whatever down the line, which was quite bizarre. Unless the investigation is reopened and someone is charged with Wendy's murder, we will never know the truth. And maybe the killer is still at large in Bakewell. As for Stephen, robbed of the best years of his life, he would be forgiven for feeling angry, but amazingly, he bears no animosity. I know I've lost a, a great deal of time, 27 years. I'm not gonna hold any bitterness towards anybody. Um, I tried to make the best of it um, whilst I was in prison. Now that I'm out, I've put it all behind me and just try and get on with life the best I can. I think it was a very good test of character, spending all that time in prison knowing that you were innocent. It would be very easy to become bitter and, you know, to sort of feel angry at the world. but. That just eats your life up even more. After his release from prison, Stephen returned to Bakewell and managed to spend some precious time with his parents before they both passed away. He still remains there today, just a few doors down from his sister. Hopefully we'll remain as close in the future as we are now. Um, it's good that we live so close to each other, so we're always there for each other. And I just hope that Steve has a, a long and happy future because he's got so much still to catch up on. So many years of living to catch up on. So hopefully it'll continue. The jobs I would have liked, I can't do. Um, and, uh, and in fact, it, even now, it's, it is difficult to get work of any dis description. I just have to try and get on with things as, as, I'm, well, as well as I can. Um, I've still got my sister, and uh, we're there for each other, and we'll, you know, lead as full a life as we possibly can. So Stephen's case is a testament to the tireless efforts of his family and, of course, to investigative journalist Don Hale to clear his name and, above all, to demand justice. 
because an innocent man was sent to jail for 27 years whilst the real killer remained and still remains at large. The result was that Stephen spent the best years of his young life behind bars. Although rare, sometimes, sometimes, just as in this case, innocent people are convicted. Do you have a case to bring to my court? On Judge Rinder, there's a chance for you to have your legal case heard. Does someone owe you money? Are you desperate for a debt to be repaid? Let me settle your dispute and get you the justice you so richly deserve. If you're 18 or over and would like to be considered for the show, text the word judge plus your name to 6334. The text costs 25 pence plus one standard network rate message. Or call 090 1122 Calls cost 25 pence plus your network access charge. Or email judge at itv.com. Please note we are unable to consider claims that have been or are currently in court.